a very pleasant morning to our participants from the industry, research institutes, universities, schools, and the public. Welcome to the Kuala Lumpur Engineering Science Fair, KLSEF webinar. The KLESF webinar, uh, KLESF, which is held virtually this year, is an initiative with various programs and activities that aims to promote interest and awareness in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM among our younger generations. Today, we have two speakers for, from University Tunga Abdul Rahman. With us today, Dr. Ong Mei King and Dr. Tanji, who will be sharing with us the latest trends of agriculture and food technology towards food security and sustainability. Before we begin, here are some housekeeping announcements. All participants will be muted automatically by the host throughout the webinar. A Q&A session will be conducted after both speakers have completed their sharing. You may type your questions in the chat box. We would appreciate it if you could kindly introduce yourself during the session. Lastly, a group photo session will be conducted after the Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce the first speaker for today. Dr. Danji is an assistant professor from the Department of Agricultural and Food Science. His field of expertise is on biodiversity and molecular taxonomy. Let us welcome Dr. Tan to share with us the current technologies in the molecular breeding of agricultural crops. Dr. Tan, the floor is yours. Good morning. Can you guys see the slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Clement, for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Tanzi from the Department of Agriculture and Food Science, University of Tungkaturaman, Utah. Today, I'm very happy to be here with you to share, to talk about this topic on towards food security and sustainability, latest trends in agri-food innovation and technology. Now, before I begin, based on my understanding, this STEM webinar is targeted um, to the public, uh, secondary school students, as well as uh, school leavers and university students from other courses. So I've tried my very best to make uh, sure that this uh, talk is as simple as possible and less technical. So, but if you have questions, please feel free to ask. And if you want to write to me, my email is made available here. Now, before we begin, I think it's important for us to talk about the definition of food security and sustainable development. Food security is defined as the ability of people from different social, physical, and economic status access to sufficient amounts of nutritious, safe, culturally appropriate foods at all times. So food security is not just about preparing enough food to feed the world, okay? The food themselves has to be of sufficient quality, all right? It has to be safe, of course, and made available for people of different culture and beliefs. On the other hand, sustainability is defined as the development that meets the need of our current generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this sustainable development is something that is uh, very popular nowadays. I'm pretty sure most of you guys have already heard of the, of the 17 Sustainable Developmental Goals, which has been outlined by the United Nations. Okay, so there are 70 areas in which we can improve upon. For example, there are many practices uh, today which may not exactly be very sustainable. In agriculture, for example, the indiscriminate use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, antibiotics are not exactly very sustainable. Okay, because we know they are going to adversely impact the environment, okay, the ecosystem, and it may actually impact human health as well. So definitely there is something that we can do to improve, to, to make our practices a lot more sustainable, to safeguard the future of our planet, as well as our children's children. Okay. 
Okay, as an academician, we often spend time in educational fairs. And in educational fairs, we always encourage aspiring agriculture and food science students to pursue this particular course. Okay, why? Because, I mean, the, it's very obvious why. Because we can expect the human population to expand. In fact, there will be an estimated 9 billion people to feed by 2050. So the demand will always be there, right? And in terms of uh, commodities, which are important, you have fruits, vegetables, and meats being identified as essential, okay, in the coming years. If you look at this particular chart, uh, you can see a consistent increase in the number of population, okay, with most of the demand for food coming from the developing countries. Okay, where most of the populace is based. Therefore, in order for us to cater to this increasing demand, naturally, the agriculture and food sectors will have to step up their game. Now, some of you may be wondering, we, this is expected, right? We know we, the human population is expanding. We are already increasing production, right? Not really, because this time around, we have additional challenges as compared to the previous decades. So in this case, we have problems with dwindling resources. Space is limited now. So you can't just develop new land and just keep increasing the size of your farm to increase productivity. We have problems with climate change, okay, where we have uh, temperature fluctuations throughout the world. All right, and this is definitely going to affect your crop cycle. It's going to affect the productivity of your crops, the quality of your crops. And of course, ultimately your you. And then of course, we talk about sustainable development. So we can no longer keep on using chemical fertilizers and whatnot, which may actually jeopardize the quality of the planet. This means in spite of all these challenges, we still need to increase food production by an unprecedented 35%. And mind you, not by 2050, but by 2030. Okay, and that is rather challenging indeed. And this may seem like a very daunting task, and it may also seem impossible. However, science and technology has progressed greatly over the years. Okay, and we have many new technologies being adopted and practiced to help us achieve this goal. In agriculture, uh, I mean, agriculture deals with plants and animals. In, in the case of plants, you have, for example, plant tissue culture technology that allows you to greatly increase the number of clones of quality crops so that you will be able to plant large numbers of them. Bananas, pineapples, for example. And then there's the recent talk about uh, people going into vertical farming, rooftop urban farming, which saves a lot more space. And if done correctly, will reduce uh, pests and diseases. And of course, indoors, you'll be less susceptible to environmental conditions. Next, you have the development of eco-friendly fertilizers and so on. In animals, you can use assisted reproduction, uh, improvement of animal nutrition, in vitro fertilization, all of which will help you greatly increase the number of livestock animals in your farm in a shorter amount of time. Of course, there are also technologies that can be applied to both plants and animals. In this case, selective breeding, molecular breeding, which is uh, what we're going to talk about later. Ploidy manipulation. Uh, apologies, Dr. Tanji. Yes. Uh, it seems that your slide is not transitioning. Okay. Yeah. Can you? Let me share. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Okay, let me share again. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Is everything okay? Uh, can you try? Okay, I'm moving the slides now. Uh, no, it's still not moving. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. Where was I? Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. Okay, we were talking about uh, technologies that can be used for both plants and animals. And ploidy manipulation, is uh, where you can produce triploid fish, for example, which are a lot faster growing and also sterile. Uh, this is also how you can, it, the technology can also be used to produce uh, seedless watermelons and grapes. You have genetic transformation where DNA is taken from one organism and 
put into another organism which can be unrelated. And we have, of course have precision agriculture, which is very popular today, in which uh, we rely on automation, sensor technology, as well as, as the internet to greatly enhance the efficiency of farm management. Okay, and, and there are obviously a lot more technologies out there. And all this technology will help us help facilitate our strive towards food security and sustainable development. Molecular breeding. The definition of molecular breeding differs from one person to another, from one source to another. But in the very general sense, molecular breeding is defined as the use of genetic manipulation at the DNA level to improve traits of interest in plants and animals. So what are traits of interest? Traits of interest are basically traits which are desirable to either the farmer, to the food manufacturer, or to you as the consumer, right? So this can range from the color of your salmon, the fragrance of your durian, the ability of your banana to, to adapt to arid and dry conditions, so on and so forth. So there is an end goal to molecular breeding. Okay, so it's not just done for fun. And in this molecular breeding, the technology oftentimes include genetic engineering and gene manipulation, molecular marker assisted selection, and genetic selection, both of which we will talk about later. But in a stricter sense, molecular breeding don't usually include genetic engineering or gene manipulation, which involves DNA taken from one species put into another organism of unrelated another unrelated organism and that can lead to controversies okay so i'm not going to include gene genetic engineering and gene manipulation in uh, when i'm talking about molecular breeding today before we go into molecular breeding we have to talk about selective breeding which is uh, very closely related to each other and i'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with selective breeding because you have definitely learned about it before uh, especially when you started to <clears throat> learn about Gregor Spendel's experiment. But just a recap, selective breeding is also known as artificial selection. It's a process by which humans use plant breeding and animal breeding to selectively develop desirable phenotypic traits. So traits that you can actually see. Artificial, okay, so meaning man-made. Somehow humans are involved, but you cannot use the term artificial selection when you're selecting your boyfriend and girlfriend. Okay, so this method is only used for plants and animals, not humans. So to give you an example, if you are a farmer, you have a crop, you have a male crop that grows very fast, you have a female crop that also grows very fast. As a farmer, it makes sense for you to uh, cross these two plants in hopes of getting offsprings, which are even faster growing, right? So how is this done? It's very simple. In the case of plants, all you need to do is use, as an example, use a brush to collect pollen from the uh, male flower and then apply it onto the stigma of the female flower. Okay, this is going to lead to fertilization, production of seeds. And all you have to do is allow the seeds to germinate. You take good care of it. And from there, you will be able to see whether they are faster growing than their parents or not. Most of the time, they are going to be faster growing, just like you guys. Most of you are taller than your parents, unless if you're very unlucky. Okay, so that is how it works. So you have studied Gregor Spendel's experiment and his uh, laws of inheritance. So in his experiment, he has also selected various traits. Okay, this includes flower color, uh, shape of the seed, color of the seed, so on and so forth. All these are traits that can be selected for. So now, by now, you may be thinking, Okay, that's interesting. Is selective breeding common in our everyday lives? Or is it some jargon that some, some lecture talk about in the, in the lecture slides? The answer is that it is a lot more common than you would expect. I still remember back in primary school uh, when my mom told me broccoli and kale are the same thing. And I was like, what? How can it be? They are so different. They look so different from each other, right? But the truth of the matter is that, yes, they all came from wild mustard, brassica oleraceae. So this applies to other cold crops like cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, colabri, and many others. The main reason why they look so different from each other is because they have been selected for different traits. In the case of kales, agriculturists, scientists, they bred this wild mustard with emphasis on the leaves. 
All right, whereas for broccoli, the selection was on stems and flowers. So after many years, many generations of selection and breeding, we end up with cold crops such as this. Okay, keyword, many years, many generations. This doesn't happen overnight. You cannot expect your wild mustard to turn into kale in like one day, uh, one cycle of uh, selection. It doesn't work like that. Okay. So another example would be your dogs. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of pet lovers here. You know, there are many breeds of dogs. You have your chihuahuas, you have your pug, your bulldog, your Siberian husky, so on and so forth. They look so different from each other, but they are still all considered under the same species. DNA analysis have shown that all these dogs actually, they are all descendants of the common ancestor of grey wolf. And grey wolf is of course found in the wild, obviously not in Malaysia. The only reason why we have dogs, so many different types of dogs today, is because our ancestors, human ancestors, they decided to domesticate the grey wolf. So what happens is they capture the grey wolf, they breed them for a few generations, they try to first select for friendlier traits so that the dogs are not as feral and not as wild. And then with time, we have a lot of professional breeders breeding, the, selecting for different kinds of traits and end up you have so many different types of dog breeds today. Okay, so that is how it works. There are plenty more examples out there which uh, we don't have time to cover all of them. Uh, another one would be your bananas. So uh, if you visit kampung areas, it is not uncommon for you to find wild bananas. Oftentimes you'll see the bananas being very different from the ones that you're familiar with. Uh, one thing, the fruits may actually grow upwards. And if you peel the skin, you may actually, you will be greeted by a lot of seeds. Okay, definitely not something you would want to try to eat. And this is, of course, very different from your commercial cultivar, say your Cavendish banana. In this case, you see the fruit is so, so much larger, the skin is so much more appealing to look at, and of course, no seeds. Likewise, you have your Siamese fighting fish, which are specifically bred for flamboyant colors, wonderful fins, yeah, and colors. If you, look, if you take a look at wild ones, you'll realize that they are very, very different. Okay, so th there are many more examples which we will not cover, but many of the things that you are familiar with are results of selective breeding. So by now, you may be thinking, selective breeding seems very good. Huh? Why, why don't we just continue to do selective breeding and probably we will be able to fulfill our demand for food security and sustainable development by 2030. Now, as with all technologies, there are disadvantages to each to every technology. And... Based on all the examples we have discussed so far, all these are observable traits, traits that are relatively easy to see and observe, right? But what if I'm asking you to select for something that you can't really see? So for example, if I'm asking you to select a plant that has a adaptability to climate change, it's not something that you can observe easily. So the selection process becomes a lot harder. So to give you an example, I'm giving you 18 glasses here. The glasses, some of these contain seawater, some of them contains fresh water. Now, if I, I'm asking you to tell me which of these glasses contain seawater, you don't need to answer. There's no way for you to know because I also don't know because they all look exactly alike. Okay, so selection, it becomes a very big problem. However, if we can somehow use a marker to tell us which one of these glasses contains seawater, it will be a lot easier. Am I right? So if we can devise or develop markers, perhaps markers detecting for salinity, these markers, as uh, shown by these pink stars, will tell us, okay, these three glasses here contain seawater. So we just need to select these three. Very straightforward. Okay? So let us look at another example, this time using plants. Now I'm giving you 18 seedlings, which you have just germinated. And my question to you is, tell me, which of these seedlings will produce large fruits? You will not be able to tell me the answer because these are all seedlings. They are so young. How do you tell, right? Uh, convent in the con I mean, if you are to find out, you need to take very good care of these 18 seedlings. You allow them to grow up. They will fruit. Maybe after five or six years, depending on, your depending on the species you're growing. And then only you realize, okay, this one has very small fruits. So you have wasted your time. Okay. 
So you can probably see now if uh, some of the limitations of this normal selective breeding, it takes time. So if we can devise markers that can tell us precisely which of these seedlings can produce large fruits immediately, no need to wait five or six years, that would save us a lot of time and resources, right? So how do we go about this? Simple, we use markers. In this case, the markers would be DNA. We all know that DNA is uh, present in all living organisms. So in this case, using technology that is available today, we can easily extract DNA from all 18 seedlings, okay? And uh, we can just amplify them, sequence them, converting them into information that is easily understood by computers as well as scientists, right? And from there, we can look for DNA markers, specifically in this case, DNA markers that is linked to large fruits. All right, so when we do this, we will be able to identify, pinpoint exactly which seedlings are going to give us large fruits five or six years down the line. This means we will be able to do the selection immediate, almost immediately, right? And it will save us a lot of time. Not only time, it will save you a lot of resources as well because you know the, the other 14 seedlings are useless. They can be discarded. Okay, so you just only focus on the four here. Okay, so hopefully you can understand how uh, this marker technology works. All right, so essentially we are using markers, in this case, DNA markers, to help us identify traits which are linked in its DNA. Okay, so we are using markers for selection. And oftentimes this technology is referred to as marker-assisted selection or marker-assisted breeding. The technology is the same. It's just the, uh, it's, it's just the purpose of you, you using it for. So if you are selecting for breeding purposes, it's called marker-assisted breeding. If you're using it for other purposes like planting, it can be called marker-assisted selection, right? So hopefully you have graphs, uh, some idea of uh, this selective breeding and molecular breeding to help strengthen your understanding we will, take a, an, we will take a look at another example comparing selective breeding and molecular breeding in an oversimplified example. Okay, so this example is a lot simpler than it seems using our favorite durian. So you, you guys know that there are many different types of durians, okay, many different varieties. Some have red color, some have big pulps, some are flavorful, some are aromatic, some taste sweet, some taste bitter, okay? So imagine as a farmer, you have these two types of durians. One is flavorful and aromatic, but unfortunately, the pulps are very small. On the other hand, you have a durian with large pulps, but they don't taste very nice. In this case, it makes sense for you to cross these two in search for the ideal fruit, which will produce flavorful, aromatic, as well as large pulps. So that is the end goal. So you, to do this, you can do manual pollination again, just like what we have discussed, and uh, fertilization will occur, producing let's say nine seeds, okay, nine durian seeds. In selective breeding, which is also called conventional breeding now because it's pretty old school. Uh, in selective breeding, you, there's nothing you can do. The only thing you can do is germinate these seeds, take good care of them, all nine of them. So probably you need to wait seven to 10 years before they fruit. Then only you can know whether your breeding uh, experiment has su is successful or not. On the other hand, Molecular breeding, uh, you still need to do the pollination and all this. And once you get your nine seeds, you can then subject them to DNA tests immediately. Okay, you don't need to wait for them to grow up. You can just run the test immediately. And in this case, you are looking for DNA information. You're looking for specific DNA markers linked to desirable traits. So in this case, you, can ha you have the purple, purple DNA region here, DNA marker here linked to large pulps. You can have the pink one linked to flavorful pulps, blue one linked to aromatic pulps, green links to bland pulps. So this is not something we want. Uh, yellow marker linked to small pulps. So just by looking at the presence of this DNA markers, okay, you will be able to select and you will know at the end, out of all these nine seeds, only one of them will give you flavorful, aromatic, and large pulps after seven to 10 years. Okay, but in this case, since you have run the test on the seeds themselves, you will know immediately 
this is the one you want to choose to grow, for example. The rest can all be discarded because they are not ideal. And if you look at this, only one out of the nine seeds here are actually ideal, is ideal. As compared to selective breeding in which you select using your eyes, okay, which is not exactly that uh, accurate, there is always a chance of you selecting wrongly. Okay, so that is one of its differences. And from here, you can probably tell what are the advantages of molecular breeding or molecular selection. First of all, it would be reduced selection duration. So you save a lot more time because there's no need for you to wait seven to 10 years for your durian to fruit. And then because you have saved a lot of time, you have more time to spend on creating more breeds, right? And we have already covered that uh, identifying based on DNA would be a lot more accurate. And one more thing is that uh, this type of identification is environmentally insensitive. Imagine if I give you two plants, identical, you plant one under the sun, another one without the sun. After two or three days, they are going to look very different because plants are plastic like that. Okay, so if you're not very familiar with the plants, there is a high chance that you're going to select wrongly. Fortunately, DNA is generally not as affected by environmental conditions as much, so you don't have that risk of selecting wrongly. <laughs> a typical good example that is uh, often used for uh, marker selection would be that of this uh, virescence and nigrescens oil palm branch. It's a very simple example where virescence fruits will undergo clear color change on ripening. So they will basically change color telling the harvester that it is ripe so that it can be harvested, therefore reducing losses in oil palm plantations. Right? So this marker, it's very simple, but it's very effective. And uh, it's a typical example because it is monogenic. This trait is just controlled by one gene, very simple, which leads us to the challenges of um, using this molecular selection and molecular breeding. One of the main challenges is that many of the commercial traits that are valuable to us, a lot of them are complex. So for example, uh, increased yield, better oil quality, uh, tolerance to pests and diseases, uh, adaptability to climate change. Many of these are very complex traits. So they are not just controlled by one gene. In fact, they may be controlled by many genes uh, linked to each other, and they may, be, they may be located at different locations at different chromosomes. So in order for us to effectively apply molecular selection or molecular breeding, it is very important that we understand, we document the genetic information of the species of either a crop or animal that we are working on. Thankfully, with newer technology like next generation sequencing, this allows scientists, geneticists, agriculturists to, it facilitates the process of unraveling the genetic information of this uh, species that we are working on. So all in all, one thing we know for sure is that if and when we have this information made available to us, the application of this molecular breeding will practically be limitless. Okay, because we can choose to select whatever we want according to the need that arise. All right. So using this technology together, of course, with other agri-food technology, which will be covered later, this will definitely help us improve substantially the, not only the quantity, but also the quality of the food that is being produced, propelling us towards food security and sustainability. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Back to you, Dr. Clement. Hey, thank you, Dr. Tanji, for the informative uh, sharing. Uh, indeed, molecular breeding has played an important role in uh, providing us with crops of desirable traits, okay, so that we can enjoy all types of uh, crops of different uh, taste, flavor, or even uh, 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 physiological growth. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for the uh, sharing. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker for today is Dr. Ong Mei King. Dr. Ong is the head of the department and an assistant professor at the Department of Agricultural and Food Science. She has a vast experience in the field of food preservation, functional foods, food product innovation, and post-harvest technology. In today's webinar, 
Dr. Ong will be sharing with us the current climate smart food technologies used in the agriculture sector. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ong. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Clement, for your kind introductions. Yeah, good morning to all audience here. Yeah, it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to share some things uh, about, uh, to share something with you about the latest trend in agri-food innovation and technology today. Uh, as Dr. Tanji has covered more, more topic related to the current or the emerging technology in agriculture. So I'll be sharing more on the food related uh, innovations. Yeah, allow me to share my slide first. Okay. okay, I hope you can see uh, the first cover slide. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so today's the, my, the overview of my sharing today will cover all this. Yeah, we, I will be talking about the role of food processing and its demands yeah, in this uh, current uh, era. And also, uh, we, we will know what are the conventionals and the current trend of food processing nowadays. And also, we hope by understanding the factors affecting food production and food processing, we can uh, tackle the issue of food security and food, uh, in order to tackle this uh, food security. And I will introduce uh, this climate smart food system uh, uh, to all. Yeah, what is uh, meant by this food system? Uh, this sustainable and uh, resilient food systems and also the future food yeah okay so um because we know that uh food processing is a uh, important link between the production yeah from agriculture yeah and uh, also the consumption within the food value change actually food processing is the necessary conversion of raw material as you as you can see example is the paddy yeah, which is uh, raw, yeah, can't be eaten like that. And we need to process it to a form that is edible, yeah, such as uh, the rice grain, yeah, we have to apply heat and so on. And also make it more functional and culturally acceptable food product, such as we can uh, transform it into another uh, variety of food, such as the uh, rice cereals or even the um, rice yogurt and so on, yeah. Okay, so this is basically uh, what uh, is the food processing. And most food needs some form of preparation and uh, processing to make them more attractive. Lah. Yeah, and also safe to be consumed. So there are three types, uh, major three types of uh, food processing, namely primary, secondary, and tertiary. So primary processing are mainly like the basic processing, such as the drying, uh, uh, to dry uh, the food product, yeah, you, uh, I mean, using less, uh, no energy, or maybe use only the renewable sources without the electricity, or even the milling process or oil extractions. Yeah, so it's the uh, without much uh, process, yeah, processes. And for the secondary processing, it will involve uh, the further processing of the uh, primary processed food so that uh, it will further formulate it and manufacture into a form of the food which are ready to be eaten, such as the bread, yeah. So for the tertiary food processing will be those food, uh, they are more uh, like uh, for convenience, yeah. So we can just, uh, it's already cooked and it's ready to be eaten, yeah. So we just need to further warm up the food, yeah. So this will be the, tertiary food processing to prepare this kind of uh, convenient food yeah, in, the, uh, in our counter today. Okay, so let's look at the role of uh, food processing. So there are many roles of uh, food processing, such as uh, one of the important role is actually to reduce the agricultural food waste. Or uh, in other way, we can mention that it, it, it is used, it is important to improve uh, to achieve this food security lah. because we uh, food security as mentioned uh, by Dr. Tanji is actually is when uh, all people have the access to this uh, sufficient food supply, uh, not only sufficient but also uh, affordable, cheap and uh, healthy, yeah, nutritious to uh, promote a healthy uh, life lah. yeah. 
So uh, in other way, uh, in other, uh, I mean, in, uh, in other function of this food processing, actually it's also meant to uh, prolong the food, uh, the raw food. Uh, yeah, so uh, because raw food is very perishable, so food processing uh, play a very important role to uh, prolong the shelf life uh, of the food. So it can be stored uh, more than uh, two, three years, yeah, and so on, if it's really uh, preserved well. So, um, okay, we know that uh, by this food pre preservation, it can uh, actually, the main purpose is to deactivate the spoilage or pathogenic microorganism. Uh, and also to make it more available, convenient, for people, yeah, and also we have we can have a better variety of uh, food by uh, with better taste, yeah, and uh, with this food processing also we will uh, hope to uh, achieve some personalized nutrition, yeah, by incorporating uh, all these um, uh, nutrients that are uh, real, I mean related to to meet the requirement of a specific group of people, yeah, such as uh, people with uh, diabetes or with uh, special uh, uh, disease and so on. So with this uh, kind of uh, food processing, it can produce uh, various food that have uh, better nutrition, yeah, which can be also fortified and enriched yeah, for uh, the, 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 to promote the health of the people. And by this uh, food pro processed food, yeah, it actually uh, with a proper packaging and also uh, in a dry form. So actually it can ease the marketing and distribution task as well. Yeah, uh, because there are so many types of uh, food packaging in a variety form, yeah, which could be uh, easily uh, packed and uh, distributed. Yeah. Okay, so these are all the major roles uh, of food processing. And uh, food processing should also be emphasized, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, to maintain this continuous food supply, yeah, in addressing the challenges in delivering these sustainable diets to all people. Okay, uh, let's look at the um, food processing demand. Yeah, so it is reported that the global food processing keep increasing drastically uh, since uh, year 2040 to uh, 2025 as shown in this uh, chart. So it is also predicted that the global food technology market expand uh, by 2022. So the, and this uh, market expansion will, will expect market volume that can uh, reach over than 250 million, 250 billion yeah, US dollars. Yeah, so you can see that uh, it will still keep uh, it will still keep increasing, yeah. So as shown here, so it will still keep increasing sharply, yeah. After the twenty twenty five, yeah, up to uh, yeah, the the, the, con the the coming years, yeah, in the future. So uh, in view of this, okay, uh, let me move on to the next slide. Hold on, uh. Okay, so in view of the current production of a uh, world population, yeah, because the world population also grow, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Tanji, it will grow from uh, 6.9 billion, around 7 billion in 2010 to 8.3 billion in 2030. And it will even reach 9.1 billion in 2050. So you can see, uh, from this uh, chart, yeah, actually uh, by 2030, the food demand is uh, uh, predicted to increase by 50%. Huh? Yeah, and it will also increase to 70% uh, by this 2050. So if you can see here, the current food production is uh, shown in this uh, orange color uh, line chart yeah so you can see with the population growing uh, exponentially as shown here before this our uh, current food production can uh, supply food uh, uh, more than the demand uh, yeah more than the uh, population yeah the on that on on uh, that that previous year so in 2010 uh, it will just uh, just meet the 
uh, demand, yeah, or the glo global population, yeah, with the current production uh, trend. But after uh, year 2010, yeah, you can see it will, uh, we will have some shortage. If we are, if the current food production trend is uh, remain uh, as what it is, so. Um, so it means that we, we need to have uh, the, the technique or maybe uh, some solution how to overcome to feed the world population uh, by increasing of 70% in these uh, 40 years uh, uh, based from the year 2010. So uh, by having the current food productions, yeah, it's, it's, it seems very impossible to meet the global food demand. In other words, uh, from these uh, predictions, yeah, of the chart uh, shown here, yeah, so it uh, it will it can be possible if the food production with novel technology uh, is adapted, is adopted and practiced well by the food industry, yeah. So hopefully, with the future food production uh, uh, in this uh, time and also in the future. Uh, we can meet uh, this uh, food, uh, world food global demand. Yeah. So uh, let's look on with the time and the growing demand. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Uh, I move on the next slide. Okay. So uh, by that, um, I would like to introduce you uh, what are the common traditionals or maybe the conventional way of uh, food processing method uh, and also uh, compare with uh, what are the emerging trend of food processing yeah so uh, so that we know that what are the changes have already made yeah throughout the years so that we will see that our food production is actually uh, whether is it uh, can be sufficient or feasible to achieve this uh, uh, world global, uh, I mean, world demand, yeah, of this, of the food. So here, uh, let me show you the conventional way, the oldest, the oldest method of food processing will be the drying, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, is the basic way of uh, uh, the primary food processing method, lah. yeah, which require no electricity, yeah, we can do it by just uh, exposing the food material to the, uh, under this renewable uh, resources, our natural natural source of the sun, or even we can use salt. Yeah, it's also a cheap uh, way of uh, preserving the material, the raw material, and also smoking. Yeah, using this uh, uh, the, the fire. Yeah, of the smoke release, which can also be enhancing the flavor and the. Uh, uh, aroma of the um, the fermentation is also being uh, used uh, in the ancient time, yeah, to produce uh, various uh, fermented food product like the uh, this uh, soy sauce or the tempeh and so on, yeah, kimchi and so on. So uh, we can know that uh, this process not only will uh, enhance the bioavailability of the nutrient and also the flavor, yeah. So it's actually the main purpose is also to preserve uh, the food. Okay, next one. Okay, to the newer versions of the food processing method will be the freezing using the freezer, uh, the um, cold, I mean the cooling technique. Yeah, to uh, besides use, using heat uh, treatment, we will use the cooling technique. Yeah, without the heat. Yeah, removing the heat. Uh, or even the canning process, yeah, to uh, pasteurize or even can the uh, product with the heat, yeah, and also to refresh with the normal freezer. And uh, uh, lately also is the using the a lot of chemicals, uh, preservative, yeah, which could uh, uh, is allowable if you use in uh, this uh, safe uh, within the uh, permitted limit, yeah. So, and the other one is using the pH control, like using organic acid or vinegar, yeah, all that, yeah, or citric acid, yeah, or using the uh, citrus uh, uh, fruits, yeah, those have contain a very low pH, yeah, so in this way, it can also uh, reduce the growth or retard the growth of the microorganism in the food, yeah, so to make it more uh, safe, 
more safe to be consumed and also uh, enhance the taste uh, of the food. Lah. Yeah. Okay, next move on to the newest method. Yeah. So with, uh, with this, with the time and growing demand, so preservation techniques have been improved and modernized and uh, which could be more energy efficient, sustainable and environmentally friendly. So we can see they are this non-thermal processing uh, without using any uh, heat treatment, such as these uh, UV irradiations, infrared irradiations, uh, microwave, ultrasound, or ozone. Yeah, so all these are uh, is uh, contactless and it actually will enhance more on the uh, on the preservations. Yeah, and also it's more gentler. Yeah, without uh, having a very serious impact on the sensory quality of the food. Yeah. Another uh, method will be the will be by using this pulse electric field. Yeah. Those food product will be going through a chamber uh, with uh, the electric fields yeah, to inactivate the bacteria. And also another method using high pressure. Yeah. It, uh, which means that the packaged food, the steel packaged food, will be also placing in the chamber that will be uh, also uh, having this uh, pressure, uh, high pressure, yeah, very high pressure around 300 to 600 uh, millipascal or, or 6,000 bar, yeah. So with this high pressure, it can also uh, uh, make the food uh, safer uh, without uh, any uh, growth of the bacteria, yeah. So uh, the other method will be using the co-plasma technology. Yeah, so from here, we can use this uh, plasma, uh, which, which is usually known as the fourth state of uh, matter. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's known as a reactive gas, gases, lah. Yeah, which is very uh, in the high energy and uh, ionized, uh, which can also uh, uh, molder yeah, to treat the food product. Yeah, and retain the nutritional and the sensory quality of the food. Yeah, the next one would be the membrane technology. Yeah, using uh, some uh, some osmotic pressure between the two uh, solution with different concentrations, and you uh, going through the uh, I mean filter through this semi uh, or selective uh, permeable uh, membrane lah. Yeah, so this is usually used to uh, for this heat sensitive uh, aqua solution yeah such as fruit juices or even the pharmaceutical products yeah that uh, need uh, need uh, less heat or maybe no heat yeah to treat the uh, the, the, the solutions ah. yeah so this will be uh, those the trend ah, nowadays for the uh, aqueous solution treatment yeah, another one would be on the nanotechnology. So this nanotechnology actually include those encapsulation of ingredients to provide protections uh, of the sensitive biotic uh, ingredient yeah, of the food. Yeah, if, uh, in order to avoid this, uh, uh, I mean, to, to enhance nutrient delivery. Yeah, so we need this nanotechnology to really enhance the, the absorption and also the delivery of the nutrient to the targeted uh, uh, cell, yeah. Okay, and all the purpose. So we move on to the next one. Okay, so I would like to bring your attention to what are the factors actually affecting the food production and food processing nowadays. So we all know that uh, uh, this uh, we have already uh, a lot of the natural resources already depleted yeah, because we always uh, use the resources without having any uh, uh, renewal or, or the regenerations. So, and also we have more demand compared to the current supply. So therefore, uh, it will uh, indirectly yeah, affecting uh, the way how we produce our food. Yeah. Another major factors will be the climate change. Yeah, so I think this uh, is, is it is undeniable. Yeah, this could uh, actually uh, majorly impact lah, yeah, to our food uh, processing or the manufacturing nowadays. So this one I will highlight more in the uh, in the subsequent slide. Yeah, 
so and we all we all know that the rapid urbanizations yeah nowadays also will uh will will actually change uh the pattern of how we uh innovate new food product through this food processing and this changing demography and also including the consumer preference will also drive the food industry to innovate innovate a uh, new formulated food lah. yeah that will give uh, actually give a uh, higher quality food experience yeah to the consumer because maybe they they just uh, doesn't really need uh, to just eat as a uh, to fulfill their basic essential requirement but they also want to experience experience something different or something more enjoyable uh, with the food so they will demand uh, better food or maybe tastier food yeah with this uh food experience so to give them some satisfactions yeah and not only they should have uh they, they are nutritious and uh, convenience uh, but obviously they should also give some this uh food uh good satisfying food experience yeah so this will be the current changing demographic and consumer preference nowadays that actually uh um that actually trigger the food processor or the fruit manufacturer to produce uh, more uh, uh, more I mean more uh, appealing food yeah to the consumer and we know that the global population is keep increasing yeah so this will be also affecting the way how we produce the food yeah to feed the, uh, the world okay uh, next one okay um, so as I mentioned just now, so we will focus more on the climate change, uh, the effect on how we produce the food. Yeah, because climate change uh, remains a significant threat to food security globally. So that's why I'm going to highlight this more for today's talk. So food insecurity is projected to increase with global warming. Yeah, so with these climate changes, we can see our planet is warmer. Uh, and also we have an uh, increased volume of the atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, and also uh, or we call it greenhouse gas effect. Uh. And another one we will have a very extreme uh, extreme weather condition such as drastically to food qu quantity. You can see that it will uh, impact the food quality, yeah, especially the, it will reduce the macronutrient kind of uh, changes uh, or climate in our planet. And also we can see there is a reduction of the food quantity, yeah, from, uh, from, from the event of the climate change, yeah. So with this, uh, actually indirectly, yeah, at the end, actually the the most impact will be on the human, yeah, because uh, we will because we mentioned that actually in order to have a food security, we need to have a uh, this affordable and healthy food lah, yeah, for the human. So if let's say the food quantity is uh is low, so we we can expect that the price of the food is also will be increasing. And also the human nutrition. Yeah, if let's say the food products quality is so uh, poor, so we can expect there will be a deficiency if we consume that food that was affected by the climate change. Yeah, so indirectly, it will reduce our health status. Lah. Yeah, if, uh, so this is the change, uh, how it, it influences uh, uh, the, the health uh, and the situations of uh, the human life with this climate change. And uh, in another way, it actually uh, will affect the food spoilage as well and increase food waste. If let's say the product are poor or in poor quality or maybe can't uh, be eaten, yeah, so it will be just thrown away. So this will be also increasing. So therefore, um, in order to address uh, all this, yeah, so we have to know uh, what's really wrong with our food system. Yeah, and we can see that uh, besides just now we had mentioned, actually our food production will uh, also will release these uh, uh, these carbon dioxide. Yeah, it's around 3.3 billion tons. Uh, yeah. 
recorded yearly yeah through this our productions uh process and also usage of the fuel resources and uh, fossil fuel burning and so on yeah to produce our food so um so we know that approximately like one third of our food yeah is wasted la, yeah during uh the food value change such as uh, during the harvesting or during the processing or even the distributions yeah and retail food service and at the end when it reach the consumer yeah sometimes the food also will be wasted if we buy so much food and we can't consume it then we throw it away so this will be also uh food waste lah yeah in in another words yeah we can describe it so this amount of food wasted right yeah is uh, actually 1.3 billion tons ah. yeah actually it's enough to feed uh, around 870 million hungry people in the world yeah so you can imagine that uh, we actually have wasted a lot yeah globally the food yeah so not not only that um i think we have to think seriously of uh, what is wrong with our food system and we have to think of the solutions yeah how we can uh, reduce yeah uh, these uh, uh, con I, I mean these uh, consequences lah, of the, our uh, of the food system okay so this food system actually uh, we have to think something like uh, the food system which can make the earth uh, is capable to regenerate lah. then uh, to to regenerate uh, the food or the resources which will be uh, which, which is relevant and important uh, nowadays okay so here is uh, we would like to i would like to show you that this is the current uh, introduced uh, which we call the sustainable circular economy yeah so uh, with the announcement of the sustainable development goal by the united nation in 2015 yeah actually eu country has taken the initiative to encourage uh, the yeah, industry sectors to adopt these circular economy models ah, as you can see in the third picture here yeah, so this is the circular economy economy model that they think uh, is a tradition is a good alternative compared to a linear model, a linear economy model. Because now, uh, currently, mainly we are just uh, using the resources and also dispose it at the end. Yeah, of the of the uh, life cycle of that. Uh, resource uh. and after that we improve it by uh, adopting this recycling economy models which uh, we will we will reuse it again yeah for the second time uh, before we really uh, dispose it yeah to the garbage or to the dump site yeah so for this uh, circular economy you can see that uh, actually it will keep the resources in use for as long as possible ah. yeah and also to prevent them to be uh to be disposed yeah so they will try to extract as much value as possible uh, during the usage and recover or regenerate the materials yeah at the end of the service uh, life of the resources yeah so this is the um, new newly introduced circular economy to uh to renew the uh, to reduce the waste or even to valorize the waste yeah to recovery the waste to re uh, to leading to waste recovery okay so i move on to the next one um oh yeah it will be on the climate smart or sustainable food system so what will be the climate smart food system which uh is could be resilient and sustainable yeah, to be uh, practiced and adopted. So you can see that a sustainable, uh, sustainable climate smart food system uh, shall not only emphasize the balance between the environmental sustainability and the dietary sustainability. Lah. Yeah, as you can see from the diagram here, yeah, actually we hope that by this climate smart food system that uh, the world will going to be adopt adopting this so we hope that uh, we can uh, 
make the environment more sustainable yeah by having zero waste yeah or zero waste means like uh, practicing the these circular economy uh, models or even the low carbon footprint or using uh, uh, less plastic or maybe no plastic at all plastic free and uh, because plastic uh, is very hard to be biodegradable yeah and another one is on the dietary sustainability sustainability uh, purpose lah. so actually we also hope that by having more uh, food based on from the plant yeah and which could be also healthy and uh, nutritious and also safe yeah and those food processing that could also enhance the uh, sensory experience yeah of uh, the the con of the consumer so yeah it can balance up yeah even though it's uh, healthier uh, yet it's also very um, tasty so they have to look and in, into this and uh however it, uh, the the involvement of the intelligence or novel technology in a food preparation and processing shall, shall also not be forgotten yeah so especially with the current era of the this fourth industrial revolutions yeah our our world now is heading to these uh directions with uh, incorporating more automations and digitalizations which could reduce uh, water and energy resources yeah, during the food preparation of food processing yeah, in order to produce sufficient and safe food to the world. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, see what could be the example. Yeah, one of the example in order to, uh, to have this uh, sustainability uh, in this environment, so the food system should shall have zero waste like, and more industry are uh, uh, actually uh, inventing these uh, edible cutlery or packaging materials uh, which could be edibles and also uh, biodegradable yeah this would these are the green changes that the food company uh, is aiming uh, to achieve nowadays yeah and mostly the food packaging material are from food grade polymers uh, which could be uh, made using the seaweed or wheat material, yeah, which can also be consumed and healthier. Okay, another one is on the smart packaging. So smart packaging uh, is actually a packaging that has uh, incorporating this nano sensor or maybe the bio sensor, which can also check the quality uh, and freshness of the food lah. yeah besides this smart packaging can provide uh this uh, radio uh, this rfid yeah identification uh which allow control of the authenticity anti theft uh, protection and traceability of the food yeah to to get the consumer uh, more well informed lah, of uh what are the uh the, the quality or the freshness or the um or the i mean the origins yeah of the food yeah along the food value change yeah so all this um will be uh it will be the future trend yeah for the packaging okay uh okay hand in hand with this relevant and efficient climate smart food system uh, there is a need for us to think of uh, the development of the renewable and sustainable source of food. Yeah, we need to think of uh, what kind of food source can be renewable and sustainable. Yeah, besides uh, also earlier we discussed on the uh, this food processing. Yeah, what are the food innovation in the food preparation and food processing? However, we also need to think of the source of the food. So the future food shall be able to meet the increasing global demand for protein sustainably. Yeah, so therefore today there are growing interests of a consumer in alternative protein. Yeah, because uh, protein could be uh, involving the, uh, the, the agriculture or to, I mean the, the livestock or that management of the livestock and so on. 
So actually this uh, consume a lot of, uh, or maybe releasing a lot of these greenhouse gases. Uh, yeah. So they, they are now looking uh, another trend of how to find alternative protein uh, yeah, besides the meat. So uh, therefore many companies are focusing their business on this alternative, alternative protein production. Uh, there are two types uh, of meat or of this alternative protein, or we call it uh, meat substitute. Lah. Yeah. So one of the focus of the alternative protein is the culture meat. Yeah, or we call it lab grown, lab grown meat. Yeah, the meat that is grown in a lab. Yeah, which is uh we also call it clean meat. Yeah, clean meat. Yeah, the meat is clean, <laughs> produced in the lab. So this will be uh through this uh in vitro culture or tissue culture technology. So, um, okay, so compared to the plant-based uh, meat substitute, right? Yeah, culture meat is actually said to have smaller environmental impact uh, and less susceptible to effect of climate change. Yeah, because it can reduce carbon footprint to, uh, to, to prepare, to, to, I mean, to grow the feed for the livestock and also to have the land for the agriculture or the livestock, yeah. Okay, so we move on to the plant-based, uh, another type of the alternative meat, alternative protein will be uh, the plant-based meat. Yeah, so this uh, example uh, of the plant-based meat, yeah, actually uh, is already, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean already produced by this US, US company, la. yeah, which they produce this, uh, plant-based meat burger patty, yeah, with the name, uh, with the brand of Beyond Meat, yeah. So another, um, another U.S. company, yeah, Impossible Food, also produce uh, another brand uh, of plant-based burger meat, uh, burger patty, yeah, which is branded with this name, Impossibles, yeah. And they have also supplied it to more than thousand restaurant in in that country yeah so in uh, the us itself so uh, in malaysia not yet yeah so this is uh, more uh, i mean the trend now in other uh, advanced or developed country okay so uh, we go on to the next one is on the comparison yeah so how it is being uh, made, yeah, like plant-based, we will still need the plant material, uh, like uh, those plant material which is high in protein, such as soybean, uh, wheat, pea, yeah, and then we uh, prepare it, uh, cook it, and we uh, formulate it with the additive and ingredient, yeah, to make sure the, the patty or the plant-based meat is, uh, 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 is acceptable yeah, to the consumer and also uh, have a good textures like the meat. And for the cultured meat production, you can see that uh, the, the, we need some cell from, muscle cell from the animals huh? and we need to culture it in a culture media. This culture media will have uh, a lot of amino acid uh, or in organic salt or even the hormone, growth hormone, yeah, to prepare them to be cultured and further uh, transfer it to uh, this uh, bioreactor uh, with uh, more in a more controlled environment, which can produce more uh, more cell uh, to to transform it into a culture meat. Yeah. Okay. So these are the differences or the, the, the process flow, la, how it, uh, how it, uh, how this cultured meat and plant-based meat are produced. Okay, so another source that we can consider is the, the protein source from the aquatic photosynthesis organism. So this uh, aquatic photosynthesis organism, such as the microalgae uh, or these uh, cyanobacteria and that we yeah, uh, actually uh, have the very high potential yeah, to uh, produce this, uh, we, we call it as a seafood protein. Yeah. So actually, uh, this microalgae also can be used to, um, to make into paper fibers, lah, yeah, which we can use it to replace the plastic. 
So moreover, this uh, aquatic photosynthesis organism can, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, can pro uh, can consume more carbon dioxide, yeah, than the tree. Uh, why it is so? Because it can cover more surface area, uh, and grow faster compared to the tree. Yeah. So this aquatic photosynthesis synthetic organism really have a, a lot of potential. Yeah, and this uh, microalgae also will be. Uh, I mean, the protein from this uh, microalgae can be uh, further produced by fermentations. Yeah. Okay, let's look to the other, the next one. Another one is from the microorganism source, yeah, which the, uh, the, the waste can be further fermented by this microorganism, such as the waste from the seafood, uh, the waste uh, from the cladops, yeah, and other uh, potential waste. Yeah, it can be converted or fermented by this uh, microorganism uh, to produce uh, protein. Yeah, so one of the example here uh, is the uh, a protein uh, produced by the microbial. Yeah, produced through this microbial fermentation technology. Protein with, uh, is a milk protein. Uh, yeah, produced from the microbial. So uh, it's produced by the company. Uh, in uh, in US, which called Perfect Day with the brand Brave Robert, yeah. So in twenty eighteen, okay. Besides all this, uh, uh, another one is the insect. I think this is also uh, currently practiced now. Yeah, some country they are really taking this insect, yeah, as their protein source. Yeah, and because it uh, actually they have better feed conversion efficiency, they produce faster and they can uh, we can eat the whole body. Yeah, up to eighty percent of protein, and it can uh, it can transmit the genetic disease to humans, such as like what the animal do. Okay, besides all the alternative source of protein, actually there is a new technology to convert edible waste to interesting alternative. Uh, alternative uh, customized food, yeah, which we, we you are using this 3D printer. Yeah, so this 3D food printer can build food upon the additive and automated way, yeah, using food based and edible material. So actually the food can be produced uh, with the available food ingredient uh, gained from the food waste and it can produce on the spot automatically, uh, layer by layer. Yeah, to produce this, uh, the, the, the real, uh, the food, yeah, which could have a unique textures, healthier and uh, easy to swallow, especially for the elderly. Okay, uh, this is one of the example of the 3D food produced by famous printer called Fudini. Yeah, this is the food, uh, is a tuna stack made with fungal fermented protein. Yeah, so this, uh, Tuna stack, yeah, can be supplemented with the omega three lah, yeah, using this printer. So, uh, we won't be surprised if, uh, let's say, looking for a real meat on the table that, uh, will puzzle us one day in the new in the near future, yeah, yeah. So, actually, we can't really differentiate which one is the real meat, yeah. Okay. So I would like to highlight a, a, about several examples of how the digital and uh, the automation can be used now in order uh, in the food production sector in the way of how we're going to feed the world. So one of the application is using, is using the biosensor technology. Yeah, we can get a precision temperature control real time, especially in the uh, fermented uh, large batch of fermenta fermentations. And another one is uh, using the computer vision in robotics. Yeah, so we can use robots uh, in the food processing uh, industry. And also uh, one of the example is the robotic uh, battery machines. If you can see from here, actually the robot uh, or the machine here can usually uh, do uh, dangerous tasks uh, like cutting all this with a sharp knife so it can have a it will create safer handling uh, and also it can minimize the worker numbers 
yeah, so we can overcome this uh, labor shortage problem yeah, in the future if we have this uh, robotic or automation yeah, in the food factory. Okay, next is, uh, yeah, and the application of the artificial intelligence as well. Yeah, so this in, in, included the smart machine. We can also capable of showing the food with its nutritional fact and formulation ingredient. Yeah, not only they can prepare the food, uh, not only they can track or monitor the food quality and safety, uh, but also it can uh, showing uh, all the data lah like the formulation, recipe, and so on. And also it can uh, prepare the food according to the recipe or menu that have been set in the system. Yeah. So large companies such as Coca-Cola and Kellogg's are actually employing this AI technology yeah, to increase their efficiency and profit because uh, processes such as sorting, processing, packing, quality control, monitoring, all that can be done easier and faster yeah, for those uh, leading uh, food uh, multinational company. Yeah. Okay, so next one. I think that's all for my, uh, my sharing. So in conclusion, that what I can say is uh, that, so it's important to have this uh, climate smart food system by embracing all these, if we can able to embrace all these novel technology la, in the agri food sectors in the coming years to ensure better food security and food sustainability. However, the challenges are still there. Yeah, and the mission required concerted effort and multidisciplinary approaches from all parties. La. Yeah, from food producer, traders, governments, policy maker, and even the consumer themselves towards achieving this safe and sustainable uh, planet to live for today's and future generation. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ong, for the interesting sharing. So now we know there are a lot of state of art technologies that can be applied in uh, food processing and food preservation. So thank you so much once again, Dr. Ong, for the, for the interesting sharing. So um, we will open up for the Q&A session right now. So I think based on the chat box, um, there's quite a number of engaging discussion between the participants and the speakers. So let's look at the first question. Okay, um, this is from Mr. Ramesh to Dr. Ong. Some say insects are the future food and sustainable too. What is your thought on this? Also, being vegetarian is better since we don't consume meat. Since meat production is associated with higher carbon emission. So Dr. Ong, what's your view on this? Uh, Dr. Ong, I think you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Sorry, yeah. uh, or maybe I stop sharing first. Yes, stop okay, sharing. no problem. Okay, okay uh, thank you for the questions. Yeah, so uh, actually, um, yeah, actually, uh, it depends on the individuals. Like, if let's say you, you are more, uh, pref uh, you are vegetarian, so actually you, you have the concerns of the animal welfare. So I think it's good that you choose uh, those food we plants uh, source. La. Yeah, if let's say uh, those really in the future, we don't have enough supply of food, then uh, the insect is one of the proposed uh, uh, protein la, that can be, uh, ca uh, that can, is, uh, that is recommended, la, that also uh, won't give uh, uh, this, transfer this uh, kind of uh, genetic disease or whatever to the human yeah unless the taste is not tasty maybe the food manufacturer can improvise or uh, make into powder before really transform it in a very tasty food yeah mm -hmm. okay okay thank you so much dr ong okay. there's another question for you dr ong are there any food analytical techniques that may help in food processing this is from me Okay, do you mean that uh, what kind of uh, food analysis? Uh? 
that can ah uh, yeah I think so food that can methods that can improve the quality may, or the sense the sensory. I'm not so sure. The question is that may help in food processing. Oh, that that help in or that means it's more to the uh analysis. It can be, it mm -hmm. it, it depend on what are you going to focus if let's say you focus on the safety then you should think of uh, this uh this uh this microbiological analysis or if you, let's say you want to uh produce uh, or um, i mean to to i mean to increase the efficiency of your production then you should think of uh what are the uh engineering design or process yeah that can speed up the process yeah so it, it's actually depend what you're going to determine like, is it the physical proper quality or is it the biological or is it the uh, i mean the sensory quality so you you uh, try to match it yeah of what are the suitable analysis okay yeah thank you so much um one question there's one question for dr tanji from mr ramesh um, modifying a plant genetically will alter the originality of the plant itself. Eventually, we lose the original plants and depend so much on genetically modified plants. Do you think we should preserve the original plants? Because this is what nature has given to us. Dr. Tanji? Okay, thank you, Dr. Clement. Thank you so much for the interesting question. I believe I've uh, answered it in the chat box already. So basically, I agree that uh, uh, when I was presenting about molecular breeding, uh, genetic transformation is not included. So we are not talking about introducing new genes into uh, a particular species from a totally unrelated species because doing so, yes, will cause a permanent change in the genetic makeup of the organism. But if we are just talking about normal molecular breeding, artificial selection, it's basically just facilitated artificial selection. So basically the reproduction just happens as natural, but in this case, we are facilitating the process. So it's still natural, but we play as the matchmaker. We are not introducing any new genes which are unrelated. And uh, so at the end, it is still considered as natural, right? And in the case of conversation, uh, this is actually a very good point. We have seed banks and biobanks being set up all over the world in order to conserve germplasm or seeds or important uh, cultivars or species for further research and use, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, we do have this um, to address problems like this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tanji. Um, from Ms. Yu Sin uh, to Dr. Ong, uh, we often hear that processed food brings negative effects to our health. How should we reduce the health risk brought by food processing? since we would rely on this technology heavily in the future. Thanks. Yeah, this is okay. the question for Cindy. Yeah, thank you for this. Uh, yeah, uh, interesting question also. Yeah, it's true that uh, food process will incorporate uh, all this. If let's say it's, uh, it is it, it with the addition of the chemical preservative. Like, like now, there is a trend that sometimes we can preserve it like the high pressure processing. Yeah, which doesn't really require this uh, additive. Yeah, because the concern here is we're afraid that food, the processed food will contain this uh, chemical add food additive yeah, or preservative. But if let's say with the current emerging trends, such as the, uh, like this, uh, uh, I mean the the I mean the core plasma technology, membrane technology, or this um uh, what to say uh, the UV irradiation and all that yeah mm -hmm. pulse electric. I think in uh, it actually doesn't really uh, it, it it doesn't really will use a lot of these chemicals uh, yeah in the food uh, in the processed food yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ong, for the clarification. Okay. I think there's. There's one question from Mr. Tong. Uh, it's quite long. Uh, I'll try to simplify it. Hi there, Dr. Tan. There has been a debatable topic on insect as the future food, okay? Considering the climate change and global human consumption demand. Uh, while it can be unpleasant for most consumers, uh, some countries like Thailand and China 
are some exceptions for consuming this insect in large amounts. So what are your thoughts on this matter? Do you think consuming insects would help to balance the agricultural crops for human consumption and demand? As insects are included in crop destroying pests like crickets and locusts. So I think what he's trying to say is, uh, can we actually consume crickets and locusts since they are part of the agriculture pests? In a way that uh, we humans can be uh, one of the control agents for this uh, agricultural pest. So what are your thoughts on this? Can we be the biocontrol agents? Can we humans control the pests by eating them? Interesting one. Dr. Tan, Dr. Ong? Okay, thank you, Clement. Mm. Wei Kang is a food scientist. So okay. Wei, Kang, Wei Kang is talking about uh, whether we are, we can we humans be uh, <laughs> actually controlling the agents. Yeah, biocontrol yeah. agents. Uh, probably no, because when you are culturing insects in large amounts, you do them probably indoors. You're not going to go out and catch, <laughs> catch them in the field. All right, so it's probably not going to be a solution for agricultural pests because the insects will be grown under controlled conditions to make sure that they are actually safe for consumption, right? If you ask me, it's... Hello? Okay. If you ask me, Wei Kang, it's more of a... I think it's up to you guys, food scientists, to try and improve... Uh, I mean, your question is asking about whether we, people can accept eating, eating insects or not. Yes, there are products available, but I think there's still work to do, especially by food scientists like you and also chefs around the world to make it more palatable, right? So that it will be more acceptable by people eventually. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tanji, uh, for the clarifications. So uh, Mr. Ramesh has another question. So Dr. Danji, am I right to say that there are a few banana varieties like Dole and Montel that are genetically modified because I realized that they have thicker, sting, thicker skin and longer shelf life. So what are your thoughts on this, Dr. Okay, thank you so much for the question. Again, it depends on, sometimes there's confusion because, that, because molecular breeding sometimes include genetic modification, sometimes it does not include. So, uh, in this case, the varieties of bananas that is available here, most of the time, are not genetically modified. All right? Special approvals are required before you can actually market or sell them here, okay? Or in other places. Uh, in terms of molecular breeding, even without genetic modification, <clears throat> so I'll clarify again, molecular genetic transformation involves taking DNA from one organism, put it into another. So for example, if I take DNA from an insect and put it into a banana, that is genetic transformation, producing your GMO. All right, but in molecular breeding, you just proceed as normal, normal selective breeding, but in terms of molecular breeding, the process is facilitated. It's a lot faster, that's it. It, st it still involves normal reproduction of your typical bananas, so it doesn't really involve any genetic modification based on the... It is not GMO, okay? <laughs> so it's not GMO, and as a result, I... It, they are not considered as GMOs, even though they are molecular. They have been artificially selected over generations. Okay, I, I understand sometimes it can be a bit confusing because molecular breeding, the definition is quite broad. Depends on how you interpret the definition. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Um, I think there's a last question here from uh, Wayan. Dr. Ong, how can future food scientists emphasize on if Malaysia food technologies haven't, I mean, if Malaysian food technologies is not getting and is not getting any advanced than the current state, I think this is what Wei Yan is trying to ask. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Wei Yan. So actually, yeah, in Malaysia, maybe our food manufacturer or industry are not there yet. Yeah, so, uh, however, this will be the current trend and slowly our uh, food scientists or food, uh, I mean, food manufacturer will slowly uh, adopting it. Yeah, by maybe learning the, uh, like emulating or following those uh, advanced country. Yeah, so uh, it, it takes it take some time, yeah, or maybe a generation like, uh, 20 years, yeah, to reach there. If for those uh, country that might uh, still need 
uh, a lot of capitals yeah in order to uh, to change towards these directions yeah so actually it, it takes time uh, but i think it, it will be one day be materialized uh. <laughs> yeah okay thank you yeah so okay thank you so much Dong. yeah yeah, hold on now. So I think that's the end of the uh, webinar for today. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for your kind participation. Uh, we hope that everyone has gained useful insights on some on some of the latest technology that is being applied in the agriculture sector, including the agricultural crops and also uh, uh, food uh, sector. So. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your participation and we hope to see you again. Thank you so much. See you again and bye-bye. Uh, Have a nice day. Thank you thank all. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Stay safe.